Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. My sincerest apologies for going so long without an update. As most of you know, if you don't know, I am, Jennifer and I are packing up everything, selling our house and moving across the country. And for any of you who have done that, you know, it is no picnic. It is no picnic. Especially if you've been prepping some. And we actually, we started prepping back in the late 90s. We didn't get into serious prepping. We just did kind of minimal prepping for the year 2000 thing. Didn't really put much stock in it. But because of it, we ended up attending some um, conferences or survivalist meetups or things like that and where people distributed literature and the internet wasn't really that big back then but um, people used to go to these uh, conferences and things and we'd go to a couple of those and buy books and read stuff and there was a big buzz but so of course we were already stacking precious metals at that point not really seriously but had already started collecting some precious metals and then uh, we were looking at things like fuels and storable food and gardening and seeds and things like that. So uh, in the process of moving, we've had to deal with all the stuff we've accumulated. So I actually had ordered a dumpster to dump things out because most of our stuff... Uh, the food stuff, I think the bulk of it we got at least 10 years ago. So we had a lot of uh, prep food and stuff that we basically threw everything out. So what was kind of interesting about that was that I, uh, as I was throwing things out, I got a chance to check the different products to see how they'd lasted. So we had... Um, we had buckets, the five-gallon buckets that you can get that are uh, sealed in a vacuum-sealed uh, mylar and then uh, sealed in five-gallon buckets. Um, we had the cans. Um, we had, and those were the ones, the cans from the, you know, the survival places rather than just, you know, canned food from the store. We also had lots of canned food from the store. We had rice. We had beans. We had everything. So basically, as I was in the process of chucking all this stuff out, and yeah, I threw a lot of stuff out. I probably, we had, I think we had, mm, I would say, two or three years worth of food for the two of us. Um, and a pretty good, pretty good variety. Not a lot of MRE type stuff, but a lot of uh, good, you know, uh, emergency food supplies. But anyway... So in the process of throwing all this stuff out, I checked on all of it to see what it was like. And just to give you an example, uh, we had the five-gallon buckets of uh, vacuum-packed mylar, packed uh, oats, uh, rice, um, hard red wheat, black beans, uh, lima beans, pinto beans, whatever, all the beans. And so with the grains, what I found was that, uh, now it's kind of interesting because I had, I was eating some peanuts that I had uh, found in the cupboard and they had this kind of weird smell to them. I can't really describe what it was. It wasn't, it wasn't rotten. It was just kind of, they smelled really old and I think I had them with some cereal or something and I didn't get sick, but they didn't taste good. They didn't taste right. I threw the rest of them out. It was kind of interesting because as I was going through this stuff, this was the smell. I, I could, I know that smell perfectly. And apparently that smell is just uh, old food that's no good anymore. So the two that were the absolute worst were the, uh, the oats and the rice. Those were just awful. I mean, they were, and this is this is, ten years, at least ten years on these five gallon vacuum sealed buckets. So the oats and the rice, forget it. I would say from that experience, five years at the most. Um, 
the beans, the black beans, and the uh, I can't remember which, which one the pinto beans maybe. Uh, they had a slight smell to them, but they probably were good, and that's after 10 years. And the hard red wheat, it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. It was like uh, that you just bought it new. Uh, I couldn't believe it. So I didn't keep it. I threw it out. But just to let you know, the hard as far as the grains, the hard red wheat is... Uh, was the absolute best after 10 years and it's probably because it's you know it's so tightly sealed you know you have to grind it in a grinder to get your flour and then so that's definitely uh for the grains that is number one now we also had a lot of uh canned food and pretty much anything that was from the store it really wasn't even worth checking um a lot of them were expired 2012 2011 2013 it wasn't rotten there's nothing that was really rotten but it definitely you know wasn't any good now the canned meats that came from the um, the, the emergency food supply places uh, we had canned chicken and these were these were cooked right? we had canned chicken canned uh, beef and canned uh, bacon now the canned beef was questionable I would not recommend eating that um, the it just it the smell it didn't smell quite right it probably was safe I mean you could probably cook a little bit up and see and maybe sample it um, it wasn't that bad it just had a little bit of a funny smell to it the canned chicken was absolutely perfect uh, there was nothing wrong with it and the most impressive of all was the canned bacon we had cans of uh, the brand was Yoder which I think it's from Australia but it was canned bacon and they were wrapped in uh, like this uh, wax paper pieces of strips of bacon and they were in the bacon fat there were 60 strips of bacon per can and we had a case of cans so it was like an entire year's supply of bacon and this was at least 10 years old and we opened it and it was it was like you just got it from the store it was unbelievable i had no question that that bacon was good uh so that's that's what we experienced now the honey um the honey that came from the stores had pretty much crystallized and uh, supposedly honey lasts forever but the, but the honey that I threw out was really badly crystallized and it didn't look very good. Uh, I would recommend that if you get honey you're going to probably get a big container of the organic honey that already you know looks like it's partly separated and it's already in that state and you should be fine uh, some of the store-bought honey apparently I don't know there's something processed about it but it, it didn't it didn't do too well um, so that was our experience now I didn't really do anything we had tons of egg powder uh, we had milk powder we had all kinds of powder and stuff like that. there was really no way for me to check that stuff so I, I didn't really um, have any way to test that but as far as the winners, there's no question in the future. If I, I, I'm sure when I do this again, it's hard red wheat. That's an absolute staple. And uh, that bacon, that was great. And uh, definitely do the chicken again. So um, let's get to the markets here. I wanted to start here with this stock chart. And the reason why is because there's just so much in the news lately. I'm not even going to talk about the latest news item, hoax, nonsense, fake news. Because really, you know, that's the true story behind fake news. The stuff they want you to think is fake is real. The stuff they want you to think is real is fake. So uh, I, I'm of the opinion now that uh, with this government hoaxes and psyops and nonsense that they're doing to whatever reason they want to sway the population, I just ignore them. It's a waste of my time. It's not worth my time anymore. Um but uh, one way I look at that, whether it's the latest PSYOP 
uh, latest shooting hoax, latest war hoax, whatever hoax or nonsense they're spreading. One way you can check and see if it really is anything is uh, by the, the markets. And you can see here with the Dow, it's just going straight up. I mean, this is the hourly. You can look on the daily. You can see that spike into new highs. You can look on the weekly. Uh, and I would say these are the ones I check. Uh, if I see a big news item like some breaking story and I want to get the scoop on it, like so-and-so's Facebook page before it disappears or something like that, I'll usually go to Godlike Productions Conspiracy Forum, look for a thread. Those usually will have the news before anyone else and uh, check and see what the story is, see what the rumor of the story is, and then I'll check the markets if the markets are active. If they're not active, I have to watch for the next day's action. But you can see that certainly with stocks and if in energy, you want to check crude oil. And then in the metals, you want to check gold because gold is going to be the one that, you know, the, the big boys play with. And you can see that there isn't really any kind of crisis going on. Um, I don't even remember what the news was from North Korea, but apparently it's not news anymore. So, you know, latest saber-rattling nonsense. Uh, but if it were real, if it meant anything, if any of this stuff had any meaning whatsoever, it would be reflected in markets. And it's not. Uh, the stock market just continues to go up. Uh, oil is very, very stable. And gold, rather than rallying on fear, is kind of rolling over from this recent attempt at a new uh, uptrend. Silver's doing the same thing, you can see, kind of rolling over. So, my conclusion, um, a whole lot of noise, but no real, uh, nothing really important. So, let's get to the main story that I wanted to talk about. Now, probably my updates from this point, I may get another update in before we're on the road, but I'll probably be doing any updates from the road, and it's going to be difficult to get situated um, because we don't know where we're going to be yet. We're kind of just playing it by ear. So I, I may do updates from the road. I may throw in something from the cell phone. I don't know. Uh, I'm kind of new to that sort of thing, so we'll see. But uh, getting to the markets now, there's a lot of news on the cryptocurrency side of things. Uh, we're still seeing the negatives. Uh, I'm going to read the story here out of South Korea and the ban on ICOs there. Um, and I'm going to talk about you know what what the potential end game is uh, what I'll say the final nail I believe the final nail in their coffin is going to be but uh, looking at Bitcoin here we want to try to figure out if we're going to get that rollover of this this kind of mountaintop formation here or are we going to get new highs out of this rally uh, it's just so hard to say right now now, I personally, in my minimal amount of uh, exchange accounts that I have right now, I'm about half and half. I'm about half crypto, half USDT. Uh, I went long around this bottom here, started to phase out. I'm still somewhat long, but I'm starting to phase out, trying to figure out where this is going to go. So, you know, you can see the MACD here. Uh, we got a lower reset than we had. This divergence can be considered bearish sometimes. You can see you've got uh, this rising um, trend here. And you can see with the MACD, you've got kind of a falling trend. It's not going to let me draw a line down on the MACD, so we'll just skip that. But uh, You've got the MACD making a new low. You can see that higher here and lower there and uh, lower here and higher there. That's a divergence. So uh, normally in a rising market, as I've pointed out before, the way you use the MACD is that you buy these uh, these crossovers on a, on a bull market. You buy right there. You buy right there. 
in a bear market, you sell these. Now, if you, if you sell those in a bull market, you're going to find it reverse on you really fast. You can see right here. You would have sold there. We're already back up to there. And if you would have sold here, you would have got wiped out there. So you only take the buy signals in a bull trend. You only take the sell signals in a bear trend. But if the trend is rolling over, one of the things you can see if the trend is changing is a divergence between the MACD and this. So that, that could be what we're seeing. But again, we could also be seeing new highs. You can see we had a divergence right there. That low wasn't as low as this low, but we got higher prices. So none of it's cut and dried. So let's take a look at the uh, story out of South Korea. Cryptocurrency ban in South Korea has virtually no effect on Bitcoin. Just going to read this article. This is a person obviously is pro-Bitcoin, kind of biased. South Korea on Friday announced a ban on initial coin offerings. This follows China's ICO ban earlier this month, which preceded a short dip in value for major cryptocurrency offerings like Bitcoin, BC, I don't know, and uh, Ethereum. This time the market barely took notice. Bitcoin traded at 43.53 Friday, while Ethereum was valued at 291. At the time of this writing, both are up. 4397 for Bitcoin and 298 for Ethereum. According to local reports, South Korea decided to ban ICOs due to fears that cryptocurrency represents a non-productive method of financial speculation. Really? Non-productive method of financial speculation. So the financial speculation on Wall Street where Goldman Sachs uh, sells junk bonds that go to the worthlessness um, is that productive when CEOs of companies borrow billions of dollars run their stock price up and then take a golden parachute as they dump their options on the shareholders is that productive I mean it's it's just laughable that you know that they're applying these things to cryptocurrencies now admittedly there are scams out there and I say, let the buyer beware. Um, there were scams in the dot-com boom. But what could you possibly do to protect people from something like that? I mean, yes, uh, you can go after people who have, abs who have completely committed fraud. But then again, pets.com, was that a fraud? Was webvan.com a fraud when they said they were going to deliver groceries and didn't even have any uh, brick and mortar? They just had a website and just went to nothing. I mean, where do you draw the line? So it, it, obviously it's it's just a, a one-way street. They're only applying this to cryptocurrencies. They don't apply it to Wall Street. Uh, but actually, I think a lot of these cryptocurrencies will end up being very productive uh, in they will allow for true economic growth when they end up um, spawning uh, a type of economic revolution. I think if if uh, Jeff Berwick is right and if I'm right that uh, this is a this is a game changer, they will be very productive. Uh, continuing, this is a common theme among governments as they approach market regulation. Cryptocurrency is easily conflated with fiat money, but it's anonymous, which makes it very difficult to tax. Well, it's not anonymous, um, and that's a big canard. Um, the blockchain is public, so they can see what addresses sent to what addresses. And that brings up real quick here, I'm going to divert here over to Zcash. And the reason why is because there was a tremendous rally in Zcash uh, actually right after Bitcoin got smacked for China and for South Korea. So you can see here, look at this rally in Zcash. We're talking about 230 bucks all the way up across 400 in a very short amount of time and this is actually one that you can play I think um, if this is a legit move it's probably time to buy uh, I don't have any I may pick up some we're talking about two hundred and sixty dollars for a Zcash coin this is a coin that they cannot track this is a coin that is anonymous and obviously this was coming uh, and they knew this, but uh, so that tells me the big interest and the big rally, and you can see a lot of markets here. Uh,
Bitthumb, Bitfinex, Bittrex, Poloniex. I mean, there's a lot of markets trading uh, Zcash. And there's others. There's Dash. You can see we've got, we're back up to $150 billion on the market cap. So, and we did touch up to 157. We're getting close to going into new all time highs. And uh, so that's uh, interesting because there's other coins involved here, not just. Uh, not just Bitcoin and Ethereum, you can see that uh, Bitcoin chart is trying to take out you know those old highs. Ethereum's kind of going sideways. Uh, Ripple's very strong. Bitcoin Cash has been significantly weak, weaker lately. Dash surprisingly has been falling, and that may actually be uh, money that is flowing into Zcash because it may be considered better but again you see the market cap on all these is billions so um, continuing with the article further revelations from south korean officials concerning the ban indicate the country's concerned financial and data security of its citizens who might be victimized by predatory cryptocurrency offerings right the government's position it appears icos are more likely to be a scam than the incumbent system okay if this sounds familiar, that's because this is the same rhetoric people like J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon use when they declare Bitcoin to be a fraud or mark it to be a bubble on the precipice of bursting, though your mileage may vary when it comes to taking Dimon seriously. After all, Bitcoin is his competition in more ways than one. Boy, doesn't that tell, <laughs> tell you everything you need to know. So, I wanted to talk about this final nail this end game so let's talk about the worst possible scenario for cryptocurrencies one that i don't think is actually going to come to pass uh, and that would be what we saw in china spreading to every country in the world basically to have every country in the world outlaw the trading of their fiat currency for cryptocurrencies, whether it's Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. This is something that would have to occur on a country by country basis, and it would have to include virtually every country in the world because any country that doesn't do that and has exchanges, the money is going to flow there. The Bitcoins are going to flow there. The dollars are going to flow there. The yuan is going to flow. It's going to find a way to get there. And there's going to be a huge boom in any country that allows it. So there'll have to be kind of a united front where all the countries act nearly at the same time uh, to pass laws that prevent people from using the fiat currency of their realm. And by the way, if you look at Zimbabwe, uh, Bitcoin is becoming extremely popular now in Zimbabwe, which makes perfect sense. I, I can't believe that it didn't become more popular earlier, but it is. And the um, same thing in Venezuela. I can't believe that it didn't just explode in use in Venezuela. But uh, that is such a horrible dictatorship down there. But uh, so all these countries would have to coordinate the banning of, of, of cryptocurrencies. And that, in my opinion, would actually be the final nail in their coffin if they did that. And let me explain to you why. Currently... People who buy Bitcoin or sell Bitcoin or buy things with Bitcoin, and that includes me, whether it's gold and silver or whether it's goods and services on the internet, they tend to value them in dollars. In other words, if I said, well, what's a Bitcoin worth? The first thing they're going to tell you is, well, it's worth $4,386. But uh, it's actually worth whatever you can trade for it. it it's also worth you know if you calculate in the price of gold it's worth about three ounces of gold or so or a little bit more um but what happens if the link between fiat currencies and cryptocurrencies is broken by these governments well that doesn't mean that they're not going to have any value because they still have the value that they have as far as the ability to transact across long distances instantaneously, very little overhead, Zcash and others anonymously. 
So they'll still perform the money function that they have been performing. But if all of the countries ban them from being traded uh, against fiat currencies, then what's going to inevitably happen is that people will begin to start thinking in terms of what is the real value of these cryptocurrencies in terms of a day's labor, in terms of an hour's labor, in terms of an ounce of gold, in terms of an ounce of silver, in all of the things that we buy with money, but we also compare and contrast based on their price. Well, if the link between cryptocurrencies and fiat currencies is broken, then people who continue to use cryptocurrencies will have to start thinking in terms of what is stuff worth in Bitcoin. How many Bitcoins is that car worth? How many Bitcoins is that house worth? How, what percentage of a Bitcoin is an hour of your labor worth? What percentage of a Bitcoin is a day of your labor worth? And what's going to happen if people actually start to think in those terms? Now, we still can't really think in those terms because it's just like going from inches to a metric system. It's very, very difficult to make that transition. Your mind, uh, it's, it's so hard. But the biggest boost that there could possibly be to make that transition would be for this link between fiat currencies and cryptocurrencies to be broken by having all of these countries ban that trading. That would actually be probably the best thing that could happen to cryptocurrencies because then they would be completely on their own and there would be a totally underground economy not touching the dollar or the pound or the yen or the yuan in any way there'd be absolutely no ability to tax it and it wouldn't be traded or valued or even thought of in terms of those currencies it would just take on a life of its own people would begin to think in terms of it a lot of people would begin to just live based on it and that would actually be the final nail in their coffin because once that happens people would never go back to government issued fiat currencies so do I think it's going to happen? I don't think it's going to happen. I think that we have a multi-nation state system where there will be holdouts and they will thrive, whether it's Iceland, whether it's Japan, whether it's Chile, whether it's Panama. There's going to be a country to step up and allow the trading of their fiat currency for cryptocurrencies. But even if the worst case scenario happens, that's actually going to be the best case scenario for cryptocurrencies. And we'll talk to you next time.